Welcome to Rhythm of Previews, where we check out the preview chapters of Rhythm of War, the fourth Stormlight Archive novel. I'm Danielle from 17th Shard, and I'm also known as Fell Candy. And I'm Marvin, also known as Paleo. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> A little quick news before we begin. The Way of Kings Kickstarter is coming to a close at 3 p.m. Mountain Time on Friday, which is August 7th. And at the time of recording this on Tuesday, we are only about $300,000 from the next stretch goal. Super, super exciting. Um, so if you want, you can go check out the Kickstarter. Consider supporting if you haven't already. If you find all of those goodies to be intriguing and exciting, just like I do. Considering it will come out on Thursday, uh, this will come out on Thursday. So you you have a <laughs> narrow band if you're interested in the yes. Kickstarter. I want to see those numbers skyrocketing on Thursday, people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back to our normal content. <laughs> um, this Tuesday, Tor released our chapters four and five in the Rhythm of War previews. So if you missed the first episode, you can find it in the playlist. Um, and you can also find the previous chapters, discussions on the forums, in our pre preview chapter index, and also in the description box. So let's go. Marvin, you can start us off. Just, just, just ignore Fell's camera. The cameras are bad. <laughs> oh. we, can't buy, we can't buy good cameras. Uh, it's fine. You you can't buy Sorry. good webcams. We bought a webcam and it turns out it's garbage. At least we're recording in the day this time, so I actually have lighting. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's that's true. That's true. So uh, a reasonable time for everyone. I I apologize for for Fell, but uh for Fell's cam, but we cannot fix this problem. It is unfixable because so there are no it. webcams that you can buy. Anyway, okay, so <laughs> anyway. Let's start with uh, chapter four, or actually we're going to do this in a way that we're going to have the whole viewpoint, which is Felan for this one. Uh, we are going to th go through all of it because she has a little viewpoint in chapter five as well. And first of all, the epigraph for this one is Navani talking about her method of getting out the stormlight out of uh, the gems they, um, in order to trap a spren in it. And it's something to do with basically having empty gems next to them and they apparently drain the light out of it which is super intriguing which we're going to talk about a lot probably or at least at, at, at least and she also mentions how she won uh, the Phelan artifabrians apparently have a better method of doing it or a much more efficient one and then she implores queen fen apparently because uh, these epigraphs are from the uh, from a conference uh, they are a, a talk she gave in front of the monarchs and she implores Queen Fen to please contact her guild to please share these secrets. So anyway, uh, talking about Shala now, she wakes up uh, in the previous chapter we had of her. We saw, saw her noticing getting poisoned and like she dropped unconscious and now she wakes up again. She's being carried on the shoulder of someone apparently and has a sack over her head. And... She, well, she, we know she tries to infiltrate the Sons of Honor and she su suspects that Ayalai, the widow of Sadias, has taken over the, their operations. And apparently she is taken to one of the, uh, she's been taken to one of the cousins. And they, the son of, Sons of Honor, want to initiate her, but apparently Ayalai is not present there, but instead an assistant of her. And the Sons of Honor talk stuff uh, like uh, about. Uh, they claim they brought back the radiance and they want to want to bring back the heralds and it's all they are doing what is happening in the world right now and they apparently see Ayala as the true queen of Elethka and anyway Shalan in an earlier illusion basically in an earlier um, well uh, in another persona gave them a fake Fabriel which is supposed to detect illusions but it doesn't do that at all it just drains the gems or something like that and they then say, oh, she's safe. She doesn't use any illusions. She then is initiated and swears uh, their oath, which is also interesting what they say there, which we're going to talk about. And anyways, she tries to find out more about them and they aren't really willing to give out information. They don't want her to 
see ILI and they say, okay, we are going to take the things you want to know to her and talk to her for you. She isn't uh, one of their core members yet, but uh, one of the info, uh, one of the cultists, which they are, as an aside, they have like these weird robes and uh, that look funny and uh, they look like cultists. That one of the cultists mentions that they apparently have an informant close to Delena. And like that was one of the things Shalan was trying to give them sort of information about what is happening at Eurythiru and things like that. And she finds out that they apparently already have someone close to Delina, which we don't know who it is yet. So excited for that. And then, well, uh, so over the whole course of the entire viewpoint, we have again Shalan, Vale, and Radiant swapping the persona sort of, and then Shalan takes over and she decides to blow her cover, but instead she says, okay, yeah, I'm not who, who uh, you think I am. Instead, she is blah, 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 somebody else. And she is apparently, uh, she claims to be a merchant who knows, uh, has access to the schematics for all the fabrics that the um, co coalition has created recently. And then she, the, when, she, when they uh, say they've uh, searched her entire belongings already, they didn't find anything. She shows them an illusion of one of the of the airship schematics. I think it was. They are now in a bit of a pickle because, like, she has to keep up the new front now. And apparently, one of the members who I, I think it's the guy who brought her down is revealed to be Red, uh, one of her um, one of the deserters. She she sort of um, adopted in words of radiance, so to speak, and. Um, uh, he apparently infiltrated them earlier, the Sons of Honor, and but she, they had to do more because he couldn't rise high enough. And then uh, when Adolin sees that uh, the sack is placed overhead again because they want to take her to Isla, I think, at this point, or at least want to um, learn more from her, um, Adolin, Adolin decides to attack, and uh, that's where her viewpoint ends. And yeah. So, Danny, what were your most pressing thoughts after reading this? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> I was cracking up laughing when she's talking about the cultist's robe. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I always think that, like, in, in video games or movies or something, and they have all these mysterious cloaks that are elaborately embroidered, and they're like, how are they approaching the seamstress with that? And <laughs> it's just, <laughs> It's just a funny, like image and i'm really glad that she pointed that out yeah it's like oh uh, these are for parties or something like that yeah. She says, like, oh, yeah. oh yeah they're just mysterious like, robes they're costumes for parties <laughs> yeah i thought that was hilarious um so uh besides that um i i i liked um the the way that radiant and veil think about adolin um, Radiant approves of Adolin. He's well, because he had admitted that he killed, you know, Sadius. So mm -hmm. um, she approves of him not killing Ayali, but Vale and Shalon are kind of like, eh, I don't know. It would have solved a lot of problems. So I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then later on, also, um, when they're thinking about Adolin, um, they're like, well, Shalon needs to be able to sneak out with Adolin a little bit because she needs a little bit of, you know, attention and love and stuff. So they're kind of her, her different personalities treat Adolin in different ways, but they all kind of accept him, which I thought was a really cool way of, uh, you know, integrating him into their world <laughs> so <laughs> weird to think about but yeah yeah it's really like i, I have trouble how, how should we re um, refer to them like yeah should we say that's shalan or should we always say rail and radiant and things like that uh, but, i guess uh, yeah i guess when when i'm thinking about shalan's character i also include radiant and veil as part mm -hmm, of her yeah, character exactly, yeah. but they are all separate characters in my mind like radiant is a different person from Vale, which I yeah. think is Shalon's point in making these is way that, to compartmentalize or something. I think it's really coming through here because um, we already in her first viewpoint we got, we saw some of it, like her switching more fluidly and uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but commenting on, on each other. And it was even more so in this, uh, these chapters because 
we we she like what you said that um the relationship with Adolin and how whale and radiant deal with it and they say like oh shalan needs him and so in um on behalf of uh, of shalan then whale say something and it's like really mm -hmm. they they really are separate personalities and yeah. are acting on their own and they're like best it, friends or something yeah exactly and, look out for each other and they talk to each other a lot and so it's really it's it's one character but it's also three characters and uh, i think brennan really pu uh, pulls this off really well yeah and, and and speaking of shalon in general i also feel like she's extremely talented with her light weaving like she can pull off these really complex illusions like what she did with her notebook um putting an illusion on top of another illusion where it won't dissipate when they're scrutinizing it or anything i think that maybe she's going above and beyond a normal light weaver's abilities um and with her personalities and everything i just i feel like there's something else going on with her too yeah, definitely. I think also like that just shows that she maybe uh, or has a lot more control over her illusions now because mm -hmm. uh, when she pulls off that one where she does, she basically does a rubbing of the mm -hmm. page with her charcoal and uh, sort of reveals things like that, like as if it was um, what's the it's that's a common method of sort of hiding stuff in pages because yeah. you rub it through something. And uh, like she says that uh, she uh, is proud of herself for mm -hmm. putting off the solution. And I think it shows that she, like, I, I wonder whether it's one illusion that is, um, she's just changing as it uh, goes or whether it's mm -hmm. actually multiple illusions. And like, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where her illusions go and what she'll be able to do with it. Yeah. I, I, and then also, I think um, Radiant, was it, uh, mentioned yeah. like Shallan can make these illusions. So Radiant can't make the illusions and Vale mm -hmm. can't make the illusions, but only Shallan can. And then they're talking about how when they're unconscious, that Shallan's illusions can stay put even while they're not holding it and everything. So like when she ties it off or whatever, which I just thought was really interesting. Um, there's a lot of nuance in her abilities that we don't really think about. We just think about her coming up with new faces and stuff but yeah. um yeah. and then what else um oh the sons of honor yeah they're kind of a funny crowd because we know about them <laughs> yeah. from the prologue um we know that they're like the secret organization you know um but in these interactions they almost feel like they're kind of bumbling around like shalan's mm -hmm. impression of them is that they don't really know what they're talking about um, yeah. Like they don't know much about the radiance. They think all kinds of um, false ideas about what the radiance can do. They don't know about the life weavers tricks. Um, they don't even know that light weavers can lie when they swear, you know, their oath <laughs> yeah. to, you know, that, loyalty like, or whatever. They want in general, or they say in general that like radiance can't lie or um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, bound by their oath and can't swear false oath and things like that. Like yeah. they want her. Uh, they but oh, which in the context of the chapter they want her to swear that she's not a radiant or not associated with the radiance and like she thinks as her these stupid people i don't know that um the light viewers are in fact built on lies yeah. more or less or admitting lies and oh they're not bondsmith who are more concerned mm -hmm. with that like it's also a fun aside and they can't even Shalane. detect that the fabriel is fake yeah like that seems like, you know, something that someone who is keyed into events would be able to do is figure out that it's a fake, but they can't even figure that out. Um, and that makes me wonder, like, are they, are they represent, uh, representative of the Sons of Honor? Like mm. the group that Ristaris is part of and who I think uh, Emerim was more or less the leader in the Shattered mm -hmm. Plains at the point and is dead now. So and, I yeah, when Gavilar that. and Emerim got taken care of um mm. they kind of fell apart it looks like yeah. so they're still around and they're still causing nuisance and stuff but uh, yeah it's really interesting but uh, like these that we see here they really seem more like they're more concerned with alethka rather than mm -hmm. bring back the heralds and things like, yeah. like they say oh our true queen is ili and it really makes me wonder whether 
there are maybe just a splinter group or like a branch that mm -hmm. has gone the wrong way now that their leaders are go away. And maybe even we are going to see when um, maybe Shalan's infiltration doesn't work out, but maybe we'll, we're going to see them being you know, sort of eliminated or get, getting taken care of mm -hmm. by the real sons of honor, like the people who yeah, are led true. by Ristarets. Maybe. Yeah. Would be fun to see, I guess. <laughs> So uh, something else I found interesting about like Shalan and her current um, personality, which she is keeping up, or something that was mentioned in regard to that was um, like the name is inspired by the Herald Chana Raj, Chana Raj, or mm -hmm. Chana, and uh, the one of the Sons of Honor calls her the Herald of the Common Man. And I think that's the first time we have that attributed to her. I think mm -hmm. that was just an interesting tidbit to have about her. And wonder whether, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I feel like she's going to definitely be more prominent in this story. But like we know that a lot of the characters are named after heralds. And so it, maybe it says something about their personality or maybe it says something about what their parents hoped that their personality would be. <laughs> but yeah, the <laughs> herald of the common man. Um, it, it sounds like she's kind of a benefactor of, you know, the working class or something like that. And I, I think that's just very cool to learn because like we we sort of know the heralds as these people who wield at the honor blades and sort of are the figureheads of their respective orders, sort of. They are not really members of the orders, or not all of them. And it's cool to see them being described in the in the Warren tradition, sort of, because we didn't really see uh, or we didn't. Uh, how to put it, uh, like we have got like Talon is the herald of war and sort of Jaspian is the king of them and we have stuff like that. But I think uh, the lesser known heralds sort of uh, learning about them is also really cool because, yeah, it's just, it's a lot to the world building. It's really fun to learn like new little tidbits, especially like later in the series when Way of Kings was originally just like a big world building book. <laughs> But we still get a little bit of new stuff and it feels natural to feel like to learn new things about them. Not like an info dump. Yeah, not at all. Like it's just So uh later on they mention that they have an informant close to Dalinar too, which is interesting. Like there's someone and Shalon is completely flabbergasted by this. <laughs> Like, who is this? <laughs> yeah. um, so we have to figure out who that is. Is it going to be kind of dragged out through the first part or the book or something? Are we going to be like suspecting everybody near Dalinar? Mm. Who is it? Who is it? Um, that'll be fun to follow. Definitely, really but I, I also have no clue who it could be at this point. Well, like, yeah, it's been a year since we last saw yeah. the, his inner circle and stuff. So a lot of things might have changed. There might be a lot of new people around. So it'll be cool. <laughs> Somebody on Discord mentioned, like, which I found funny, it's probably May Elida. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the, the classic May Elida jokes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, probably I, I I suspect that it might be like an Ardent or Storm Warden or somebody like someone like that because they can be around people because people are used to them. So mm -hmm. at least the Ardents, people are used to them being around and uh, be they can be in on conversations. Yeah. Yeah. You know, someone who can hear the secrets. Talking of secrets and maybe truth as well. Um what I found funny as well is how Shalan, uh, she notices that um, uh, the son, one of the Sons of Honor is lying about something. I forgot what it was, but he basically, and Shalan says like, oh, Pattern would have liked that lie, but um, or would have found that lie interesting, but it's not really delicious. And mm -hmm. uh, I found funny how sort of the perception of Pattern of the world is um, bleeding into her own a little there. And I think it maybe is a hint at how the relationship between a spren and the radiant evolves when they have said a lot of the oath already and then there is also a sentence in there about how uh, radiant could fight veil vale could lie and shalan, shalan can solve problems really quickly or something so they all have different parts of 
the light weaver kind of persona and it separates into the different characters, but they all work together and they take care of each other and look over each other's shoulder, you know, really interesting. Yeah. Really cool to learn. But it also, like, we know that this condition is very specific to Shalan in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but still makes me wonder how other light weavers, which Shalan mentions, uh, she has her light weavers now, mm -hmm. and we've already seen, I think, Watha, what, uh, Watha um, light weaving a little in Oathbringer. And mm -hmm. I really want to know how, how many there are by now. Yep. And is is Shalon a mentor to them? Like she she went from having a mentor to becoming a mentor, or um, does she just consider them like her little underlings, where they do her, <laughs> her dirty work or something? Like it'll be it'll be cool to see um, later on uh, how she interacts with other light weavers, or how the other characters interact with other light weavers, having this impression of Shalon, and then they're <laughs> completely different, possibly. Yeah, definitely. And it's from a mechanical point of view, sort of, it's also going to be interesting because we know that Shalan, or Shalan says she always requires a drawing or a memory of what she wants to draw, wants to light weave and things like that. Or it makes mm -hmm. it much easier for her. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how other light weavers who maybe also aren't quite as artistic, but instead maybe are, I don't know, fond of music or other things or just not at all like that, how they will sort of cope or and deal with their abilities and whether they'll maybe even manifest differently. Um, oh, we need to talk about the epigraph too, because yes. um, is, it's continuing Navani's, um, I don't know, presentation uh, about the Fabrials and the gemstones. And she's talking about how they act like almost like osmosis or something when one is lower um it's filled up lower with than the other one it kind of evens out across all of them which i think makes sense because when they have the lamps filled with um the gemstones and they use it for lighting it, it's not like one will go out faster than the other it they all kind of just dim down as it uses up the stormlight that's true but what's also uh of note there with that she says that it has to be larger gemstones which have to mm -hmm. be placed around it like i guess it probably is just that the larger ones sort of have a more suction sort of for the stormlight and um are pulling it in faster because there's a larger differential there and it's sort of i think we could already mention it, it plays into the the next um epigraph already oh, where yeah. she also says that um she th uh, theorizes or outright claims that the way the the spren is then trapped in the gemstone is also probably by a sort of vacuum that re results from or at least a pressure differential is what she calls it or compares it to um, between like the outside and uh, the gemstone and then the spren gets literally sucked in. Yeah, actually, let me just go ahead and summarize that part. Um, yeah. So for chapter five, we have Kaladin, but the epigraph before chapter five, um, which is called Broken Spears. So the epigraph is um, that the stormlight in one sphere can be withdrawn very quickly, which creates a pr pressure differential with a nearby gemstone. And then you can pull a spren into it and that spren can then be manipulated as you see fit, which is word for word what she says, which I don't like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, there's definitely some physics going on um, with these gemstones, but it does mention that they don't work by the same process. It's something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's just a, an, an analogy, I think, that works well, mm -hmm. but it's not one to one. Mm -hmm. And. So we're we're getting more information about how to trap the spren, how it works, how it works to, you know, move the stormlight from one to another, all the different mechanisms of action, which is really interesting to learn. Let's see, how many times can I say that's really interesting in the podcast? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in, in an essay where all uh, like when you're writing, you have all, always have to import and words like that, you have to swap them out for others. <laughs> But okay. yeah, well, something else from the epigraphs is mm -hmm. um, in the first one, Navani mentions that apparently the Thalens have a much quicker method of draining the stormlight out of the gemstone. 
Yeah. And I wonder whether that's, uh, she doesn't really mention a time frame since when they were able to, because she says that for bigger fables, that's basically a requirement um, mm -hmm. for creating them efficiently. And makes me wonder whether maybe they might be using Chiri Chiri or a Larkin at least for it, because they now have one in their kingdom and yeah. maybe could use it for them. I wonder if they could even use the radiance and they put have the radiant just like breathe in really fast all that stormlight and pull it out of there too. But yeah, I like that idea of using the Larkin. <laughs> yeah. And I could also see it using a radiant, but um, I think just from a practical point of view, they probably want a better method as well because mm -hmm. um, always having a radiant on duty just for that mm -hmm. might be a little overkill. But also for radians who are more scholarly inclined, it's also going to be fun to do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Doing little experiments. <laughs> so, yeah, but you mentioned how you found it not so great that the spren is basically subject to the will of the Antifabrian. Yeah, I feel like there's some ethical concerns there. Now that we know that Spren are not just in the physical as these little lights and blobs and things, um, they're actual, I think they're actual living creatures, you know? So yeah. what, what, at what point is it, you know, enslaving them and forcing them to do something that they may not really be interested in doing? You know, kind of like when they use, you use a draft horse to pull a cart but at what point is it like you're, you know, you're kind of putting them past what they can take. So there's, mm -hmm. I think there's definitely going to be, um, especially the way that it's phrased, you know, manipulated as you see fit. It's kind of arrogant and like uh, you have complete control over it and stuff. So it's going to be fun to see Navani maybe going to shades at some point and meeting mm -hmm. some of those friends they've trapped and, like we have seen reactions, I think, think from Syl maybe or other um, Radiant Sprint who've said that they don't particularly like Sprint getting trapped as well. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what the lesser Sprint that are also like, uh, what is it, the Miss Sprint or whatever they are called in the, we see in the Shadesmar sequence in Oathbringer, they are not Radiant Sprint, but they are very, they are sapient and mm -hmm. um, not just like the the man man uh, the the code mandra, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I they use, how they, they use, react. They use spren in in the cognitive realm as like mm -hmm. pulling, you know, the ships and oh stuff. yeah, that's true. So yeah, it'll be it it'll be interesting to see if if we actually get into like ethical reasons because I have this feeling that we will because of the phrasing that Navani uses yeah. to describe it. Like I love Navani, but I feel like she might not be thinking about that. She might be thinking more like a scholar and less like you know a philanthropist or something. <laughs> yeah, she's very focused on the science and yeah. doing cool stuff with them, yeah. not necessarily the spren that are basically enslaved there yeah yeah which might be just you know in character for her maybe she just kind of mm. thinks she gets so involved in her own research that she kind of blocks out other thoughts and ideas about you know <laughs> if they should be doing this stuff so okay let's let's move on to kaladin's point of view because this starts with chapter five which was that epigraph uh began chapter five broken spears so we start out with Kaladin. Um, the Wind Runners are protecting Hearthstone. They're floating in the air, like sentinels just hovering there. And the refugees are evacuating. And uh, Kaladin sees the Heavenly Ones approaching. So he directs his squires and the higher ranked Wind Runners to engage according to their established protocol. And he tells the other ones, you know, um, take care of the refugees, protect them. You know. uh, Kaladin is surveying the battle and he's looking specifically for Leshwi, who apparently Kord had killed uh, last time using the shard bow. Um, he sees her, they make eye contact and she smiles at him and she kind of draws him into this fight, a dance, graceful dance in the sky together. And 
um, he notices that she's using this special spear. It's like a silver, silvery metal spear embedded with a gemstone. And he knows that this weapon, it pulls stormlight from anyone that it, it hits. So even Kaladin notes um, himself, who was infused by Dalinar's perpendicularity from the previous chapters, even it will even pull the stormlight from him. So that's an interesting new addition. Um, and so as they're fighting, he has a breather. He stops the lope and shows up. He's like, hey, Kaladin, you need any help? Are you okay? And Kaladin kind of ignores him. Um, he continues his fight instead. He notes that Leshwi is intrigued by the fourth bridge. She's kind of hovering over it, looking around it, kind of keeping her distance. Um, the fourth bridge, again, being Nivani's airship from the previous chapters. Uh, so um, he sees Rock down below. Rock will pull the spear up and lashes it toward Kaladin so that Kaladin can pull it out of the air. And uh, so Kaladin goes back after Leshwi. And uh, unfortunately, she loses him after this series of lucky maneuvers. She kind of avoids the spear throw and she uh, flies off in a complete opposite direction. And he's kind of looking after her almost enviously, like um, her her ease in her movements and everything. And uh, Teft arrives he's he shows up he's glowing he's hovering like a wise god from rock stories he asks kaladin are you all right just like lopin had um the lopin sorry <laughs> um and kaladin is uh you know answering him they're talking some strategy and he looks around he sees Rashon. Uh, actually caring for his townspeople. He notes that Dalinar is up on top of the fourth bridge and he's glowing like a beacon, which is very cool. And we'll mention this for sure after. And at that time, it switches back to Shalon, which we have already gone over. So we won't go over that part. And then when we come back to Kaladin, he's fighting in a different fused. Uh, he defeats him. He doesn't kill him. He lets him live. He's like, what's the point? He's just going to regenerate anyways. And then suddenly... A streak of red light, like a ribbon, appears, and Kaladin dodges incredibly fast, and it scares this new fused away. He he notes to Syl, he's like, oh, he was scared away because of my reflexes. Um, so Lynn arrives. They finally have their moment to talk <laughs> together. They're bickering like you know a new uh, ex couple, and uh, she just like Teft and the Lopin. She's asking how is Kaladin um, yet again, and he he's thinking like, man, why are all these people up my business? You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so then later on, Syl and Kaladin are talking about his team, about the dreams that he's been having, his nightmares, really, um, and his attitude toward Rashon. He's kind of like, oh, this guy. I bet he doesn't really care about his people he's just putting on a show he's you know um and then she flicks him and tells him stop being a stumer which i have no idea what that is but i love it <laughs> and then um kaladin sees leshwi again and the chapter ends with him just launching into the sky after her so what do you think about kaladin's point of view uh, Dalina is just apparently opening perpendiculars whenever he wants it. Like, what the hell is going on? I know. <laughs> we, we kind of failed to mention a, a lot about that, our reactions to that in the last mm -hmm. one. But what do you think about that? Yeah, so <laughs> apparently the moment in, in um, O3 wasn't just a, a, a special one uh, where Delana first merges the realms and creates perpendicularity. Apparently, he can just do it. He has done it a lot uh, over the last year, and apparently, it's it's it is very taxing on him, and uh, he's exhausted after it. But he apparently does it multiple times in a battle whenever people need a recharge, and like that's just so overpowered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um I thought it was like just crazy. He's just standing up there doing his bondsmith <laughs> thing, just glowing like a giant beacon into the air. And then the fused aren't even going after him. They're mm -hmm. kind of scared of him, which is really interesting. Like, why? Why are they so scared? Yeah. <laughs> they, Dalina probably doesn't know either. Or they, he doesn't know either. So maybe he has some capability or, uh, that he isn't even aware of that the fused are scared of. 
And then I know uh, Kaladin had mentioned he felt something and then he was briefly worried about Dalinar because, uh, you know, the, the beacon was down or something. So this was like him, his overcharge mm-hmm. or something. And uh, then he's like, oh, wait, no, it's just time. It's just because Dalinar can't hold it open for yeah. that long. He has his limits. Yeah, and speaking of like uh, last chapter, we forgot to mention this, but um, or last week that uh, Dalinar already showed his sort of supercharging ability again, where he... Um, uh, well, ch- supercharges Kaladin again with Stormlight after he has uh, depleted all his spheres. And what else was there was that uh, that was from Nava- Navani's point of view, and you heard a clear note mm-hmm. playing while um, that was happening. Yeah, and we didn't have any mention of sound for this one. I think for this opening of the purple. I didn't clarity. notice it, but I was looking for it. Yeah. Yeah, and so whether that maybe when you have sort of a short because the the supercharging is just a very short he pokes the realms and sort of you get sound out and maybe it's sort of because it's such a quick thing somebody like I think that that sound is something to do with the spiritual realm and how mm. we have the rhythms and stuff like that. Whether it's just is a matter of that's yeah, just something you do definitely a big a big part of it, like um the cymatics and stuff. Uh, there's there's something going on, which I don't know mm-hmm. what it is. Yeah, like, I'm not going to pretend to know what it is. <laughs> yeah, c- cool that it happens, but no clue. Unfortunately, yet. And um, but yeah, super cool to see that. I think that. Then I can just do that apparently. <laughs> but what did you find interesting about this chapter? Um, so I was really interested in that spear that Leshwi has. Um, I'm thinking we're we're assuming that it's aluminum or aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's it's really interesting because I remember uh Brandon was being kind of cagey about the the aluminum being used as the um Block or whatever it's called for what the training, um, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the gods. On the- so, I think that this is real. Is this is really because it's described so much like that metal, like a shiny silver metal, and um, it's not able to be lashed or anything. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. But I thought it was really interesting that we're we're seeing this in the epigraphs. They're talking about. Um, gemstones and spheres pulling Stormlight out and then Kaladin notes that this weapon as it hits you, it pulls your Stormlight out. Even Kaladin who's supercharged by Dalinar <laughs> even he's susceptible to it. So I thought that was really interesting. It'll be interesting to see. So the uh, the enemy is having these new weapons come up and then we're having new uh, you know things coming up. So um it's in- inter- interesting uh, that it's pulling the stormlight out of them, and this is their new mechanism of war. Yes, um, and speaking of that, I, I presume it's probably a Fabriel. What they you or the, the the spear? It's sort of a Fabriel built in. And I mean, you can describe me- Fabriel, yeah, as like a yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what it reminded me of was like there's a scene in um, in. We have kings, I think, where uh, we see that um, Sadius or someone has rings and they are only faintly glowing with stormlight. Mm. And I think Delina is uh, uh, remarks that apparently they were trained, or uh, some of the stormlight was drained away by a Fabriel made for the purpose. Mm. And I wonder, I suspect that this is probably something that's operating on the same principles. But it also makes me wonder, uh, well, yeah, what would you want to say? Yeah, I, I was thinking, what if it's the same metal that Moash's dagger is made out of with the gemstone yeah. in it? You know, like if, if it pulls the stormlight or investiture out of something, maybe that's how it can kind of perma kill somebody. Yeah, I, I have my difficulties with that because like we see... Kaladin says that the stormlight apparently is draining away, uh, the gemstone is apparently draining away the stormlight. Mm-hmm. And 
the smy theory would be that there's maybe something in the middle of the spear uh, on the core of the spear like a metal thread or something that is part of the actual fabria mm. and the metal around it is just to to um, protect that and it's just re really just to keep the spear from being sliced in half by shard blade mm -hmm. and but yeah it's going to be interesting to see what it really is in the end because there are many possibilities <laughs> Yeah, like what if, so if the aluminum, if that's what it is, is used to protect it, if it wasn't used and Kaladin kind of lashed that spear and was able to take it from Leshwi, would he be able to kill her permanently with that weapon? Hmm. <laughs> Good question, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to think because, I mean, obvious attention was drawn to this weapon. I mean, it wouldn't have been described and everything if it wasn't really important, I don't I don't think so. It it makes me wonder if maybe there's some kind of hint as to how to defeat them with weapons like this, or maybe Navani will kind of try to devise a Fabriel to mimic that. Yeah, that would know. be really cool. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, would make sense for something like that to at least point them in the right direction mm -hmm. for figuring something like that out. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I also noticed when uh, Kaladin was uh, fighting them, he had his uh, Windrunners go into their protocol and everything, and then he was naming their ranks. And so they're developing tactics against the um, the Fused, and they're also talking with Ash about the Fused and learning about their history. Yeah. What do you think about that? So... <laughs> Uh, it's really cool to see that the Herald and, and like at one point, uh, Kellen says that Yasna was interviewing Heralds, plural, or mm -hmm. at least the, or even the two Heralds. So they're apparently also getting stuff out of uh, info out of um, town. It's not mm -hmm. just Ash who's cooperative. So that's really cool. And I just want to see that. <laughs> like people, it's, that's a little sad that we have the time skip because we don't get to see a lot of that. but. I'm sure Brandon will incorporate it somehow. Like we're going to see one of those interviews. Yeah, um, and and just being mentioned like as oh this is this has been going on just so casually means that <laughs> it's not like some like one off or anything. Like they're in an active yeah. conversation about it. So Ash is definitely aiding them for one purpose or another uh, against the fused. And you also mentioned the like the windrunner fighting and their tactics. Mm -hmm. I also think that's really cool to see that they over the course of the year have, first of all, they have introduced their own ranks apparently because there's mm -hmm. this rank CP4 that Kaladin mentions, which no clue what that means. Like that uh, Yeah, I was trying to figure out what is that <laughs> CP4? CP4, I'm sure we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like we have military people on the Discord and they also couldn't figure out like it's not some standard, uh, standard thing that we have on Earth. So mm -hmm. some Roshar term. It's like it's just cool to see that warfare has changed dramatically, which we also had a glimpse of in the previous week, where uh, the Thalen general or admiral says that um, ships are now completely, or um, naval warfare will now be completely different. So I can believe the the Amazon or whatever blurb that says that the Fabrial arms race is underway, mm -hmm. underway and like the face of Russia will be changed forever in this conflict. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, the wind runners, uh, they, I was so surprised when he said that there were 300 mm -hmm. wind runners <laughs> and 50 are full nights. Like, does that mean like literally like all five oaths? No, I think it's just, or is that just uh, like they, they bonded Spren? Yeah. I think that's okay. just Spren and the, the rest are squires or, yeah. Um, and then there's, he was saying that the reason why there weren't more, which I was like, more, <laughs> like the reason why there weren't more is because they have a shortage of honor spread. There's mm. more potential like proto windrunners than there are honor spread willing to bond with them, except for one. And he didn't really mention yeah. a lot about it. So I don't have much to speculate on it, but it's interesting that there's one that he has in mind, but he doesn't know who they're going to bond with. If they're willing to bond with someone, are they waiting for a particular person? It's, it's, I don't know. 
just a mystery right yeah, now. Yeah, that's weird because there, like Kaladin says that, um, like I think Lynn and somebody else, I think Kara or something like that. Mm -hmm. They, if they had a spren already, they they'd surely be at third oath already, and that makes me wonder, like, why hasn't that one spren bonded anybody yet? When mm -hmm. there are so many that are very good candidates, apparently, <laughs> at least in the estimation of Kaladin. Yet, of course, just in general, why are the honor spren not willing to bond anymore? We're well, probably going to we, find out. Yeah. Recently, we've got an update to the blurb for Rhythm of War on Amazon. And I think I'm just going to quickly read it out to you. Yeah, like, uh, they talk about, I'm hearing it, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> where we are, they are talking about... Um, like we already had the, the Fabrial arms race is probably underway and things like that. And then uh, Kaladin is facing problems, stuff like th uh, that. And then we have Adolin and Shalan must lead the coalition's envoy to the honest brand stronghold of lasting in integrity and either convince this brand to join the cause against the evil god Odium or personally face the storm of failure. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, and before that, it also says that no more honest friends are willing to bond um, humans, but we have learned this in this chapter now. Yeah, so... Huh. Yeah. Well, I was, I was always wondering, you know that, um, that uh, cover art thing that he had posted where they had a challenge for artists to do cover art, and it was Shalon, and I think it was Adolin in... Mm -hmm. um, Ah, that makes a lot of sense now. Like, oh, I wonder what it, I wonder what they're doing there. So that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Hmm, I'm going to have to go and look at all of that art very closely. Now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> more closely. It's great art, really. Like the, all the contest entries. Well, hmm. cool. So that be interesting. Yeah. So I guess we are going to find out in this book why the honest friend aren't willing to bond anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it will be cool to see whether, or interesting to see whether they can resolve the problems or whether like, we are stuck at 50 radians for the rest of this conflict. Or 50 winter. Yeah, so, so basically have 50, maybe including Kaladin, we have 50 Honor Spren who are willing to fight with them yeah. in Bond. Um, we have 250 waiting for one. And I think that already is indica indicative of how um, numerous the windrunner, windrunners were during the like the previous desolations and when the Knights yeah. Regent were at their height. That's a lot of windrunners. <laughs> it, yeah, it's definitely a lot, especially in just a year's time when it took so long just for Kaladin to, you know, do his thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. There you go. A live <laughs> reaction. <laughs> to <new> information. <laughs> That was really cool. Okay. Um, so we have the Windrunners. They're fighting the Shanaim one-on-one -on -one <laughs> in these archaic tactics. I say Shanaim. Um, Shanaim. <laughs> Shanaim. I think that's Shanaim. what Brandon read it as uh, in an old reading long ago. So that's what I said. Shanaim. Like <laughs> M. Night Shanaim. <laughs> <laughs> But I say so they're, Yeah, they're doing their um their archaic tactics. It's kind of like dueling. And then mm -hmm. later on, that red ribbon of light, which is this new fuse, which I don't I still don't think we have a name for what he is no. or who he is. Um when he shows up, uh, he has a completely different tactic. He's all about ambushing, and the, uh, in the other chapter, he used his underlings to like attack and stuff. So that's a completely different thing. So it makes me wonder: is this a difference in just like how they fight normally versus a newcomer, or is it like maybe they have different orders, like Voidbringer orders, kind of? <laughs> <laughs> Not Voidbringer, but I don't know what they're called. So yeah. Um, like fused different orders, orders. Yeah. yeah, fused orders. Um, <laughs> maybe like one order prefers like an honorable one-on-one -on -one fight, and another order might prefer you know just do whatever you can to fight or something. So I'm I'm just really interested to find out about this <laughs> new fused demon-looking yeah. huge guy who can turn into light. And I think a lot of people are theorizing that maybe the why the Shanaim are more honorable in their fighting is that 
they are sort of are the Windrunner equivalent and they also are honorable, but I'm not sure whether that's the case. Maybe it's just a cultural thing and um they are they are just they are just are like that and their abilities sort of also lend themselves to that because you can't exactly go sneak around when you are flying in the air. So right. yeah. Yeah, it makes me wonder about like the the way that you would fight in the air versus on the ground too. Mm -hmm. Cuz like if you're in the air, you're in, you know, three-dimensional space, so you can have people attacking you from the bottom and from the top yeah. and stuff. So maybe they just like to do a one-on-one -on -one because it's more tactical that way or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, speaking of the Shanaeum, um we also have some odd things that Kaladin is remarking on here. And he said, says that apparently they are capable of flying more or less forever without really losing all of their white light. But once they have to heal or the use the rare lashing, what uh, he says about him, um, they apparently drain this white light. Mm. So yeah. So <laughs> their, their flying is not lashing then. I'm not sure whether it's not because uh, the way I re read it is that the lashing or what he calls lashing there is just when they do it to others and externally sort of. And um, while they are the, like they, we have wops that they apparently are much more energy efficient with uh, their flight. Mm -hmm. So that sort of fits into it. And my theory would be that they, like they get a constant stream of void light from somewhere maybe or like they get bursts of it and they are very efficient with using it for their flight and mm -hmm. so they don't ever use it fully up before the next burst comes or the next infusion of void light and when they are actually lashing somebody else they have to use large amounts because for some reason they can't do that as efficiently mm. So, but I do still think that they're using lashings for, for their own flight, just sort of different. Yeah. And I know Kaladin remarks when he's watching Leshwi, which is another thing I want to mention, but, um, when he's watching her, he's like, seeing how she can manipulate herself in the air so gracefully and easily compared to him. He says he feels like he's just a rock being thrown into the air <laughs> compared to her. So, um, yeah, there's definitely, um, something different about the way yeah. the the way that he flies versus the way that they fly. Yeah, no, um, just something that maybe might explain why they are more efficient is that maybe they have sort of some, I don't know, naturally are less affected by gravity or something. Like they have less of a connection to the ground or whatever makes lashings work. And so they just have to put in let, less effort into their lashings because they already aren't as attracted to the planet. And maybe something like that is explaining why they can be so efficient. Because with the with the they aren't efficient more uh, or generally more efficient with um, their use of investiture because the uh, teleporting fuse he has to go recharge after just three doing it three times. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it's not a general fun. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, probably going to learn more about their powers. Hopefully. Well, I would hope so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dangle all this in front of us and then not explain it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really liked this chapter um, because seeing the tension between Kaladin and Leshwi, it's like they have something personal, you know. Um, mm -hmm. she, she smiles at him when she sees him. It's almost like she's <laughs> like flirting with him in a way, like a very dangerous flirt, seeking him out and they're flying in the sky together. Of course, they're trying to kill each other. But uh, when when he, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's Kaladin. So, but um, when when she she runs away from him and then she tries to find him again and then he sees her when at the end of the chapter and he runs after her. It's like, I don't know, there's there's something between them. It's really interesting to read. Yeah, and like we know that Leshwi is one of the higher ranked mm -hmm. used, and yeah. Kaladin even says like apparently she's not, or she he thinks that she's not of high enough of a rank to um, not 
need to fight anymore. Right. But I wonder whether it's also sort of just maybe it's part of the madness that um, a lot of the fuse have that Leshri is just so hungry for battle that she, mm -hmm. even though she doesn't have to, she still does it and is sort of throwing herself into danger just because right. she wants to get the thrill of the fight. And with Kaladin. Kaladin yeah, Kaladin is providing plenty of that for him. <laughs> so And he he also compares their rank. He's like, maybe she's kind of like my rank, like not high enough mm -hmm. that I can sit out, but you know, um still important with a capital yeah. I. <laughs> <laughs> People have been choking I don't know if it was jokingly or not, but have been shipping Leshri and Kaladin after reading that now. I'm not and a big shipper, but I could see yeah. it. <laughs> And I, yeah. I like the yeah. idea of like them flirting this <laughs> dangerous game, this mortal dance. Yeah, but the like the rank comment also fit in with how a lot of people had issues with uh, how Lynn is a subordinate of Kaladin, and like that mm. catch just, just couldn't work out, and is also yeah. like actually illegal in our militaries, and uh, it's sort of an interesting would be an interesting dynamic if some. It yeah, their relationship <laughs> didn't work, obviously. Like, we know that. Yeah. It was, like, over and done with really fast. But um, it makes me wonder if maybe Kaladin is, like, doing the blame game on himself. Like, it was mm -hmm. me, you know. <laughs> um, is it because I'm a higher rank? Uh, something was wrong, and he can't figure it out, and so he's internalizing it. And you can see that in his, um, like, snappy response to her when she asks how he's doing, mm -hmm. if he's okay and stuff, so. Um, I really liked that we got a little bit of um, in more information right after learning that they were together and then we immediately see them <laughs> talking to each other and um, see the fallout of that very quick relationship. But I mean, uh, you also see Lin is still concerned for him, so it's mm -hmm. not, they didn't fall well, apart. Well, I mean, she's part like, of his squad. She's, yeah, part of, yeah. she's on his team. And that's another thing, like all of these people, Taft and the Lopin, even Rock, uh, they're all caring about his well-being and his mental well-being too. Not just like, how are you doing in your fight? It's more like, are you tired? Like, do you need a rest? I yeah. can take over for you. Let me help you. And I, I really find myself frustrated with Kaladin. And <laughs> I understand yes. he has he has his own demons. Um, He has his depression. He has problems with accepting things um and so he can't accept their worry for him he can't appreciate that they're worrying about him he's frustrated with them and um, it's making me mad that he's angry with them not letting them take care of him yeah. once in a while and it actually shows me that he's very close to a burnout like very close because i understand how that feels when you get frustrated with people trying to help you you're like okay just let me deal with it you know so he's he's really close to some kind of a big burnout. Mm -hmm. And something that also plays into it, I'm not sure whether it's directly related, but um, uh, we have had it multiple times now in the, in these chapters already that apparently when Kaladin heals something with Stormlight, he still feels sort of a phantom pain. Hmm. And that makes me wonder whether... That's him, right? Yeah, I don't think we have that from anybody else. So makes me we have also thought about maybe it has to do with him getting addicted to his storm right now mm -hmm. and that just doesn't or can't work out well with his already uh not so great depression and or maybe like like his his brands maybe he's feeling like he deserves that pain, mm -hmm. you know, and so he's allowing a little bit of it to seep through after healing himself. Like he needs to heal himself so that he can yeah. protect others. But maybe he's kind of punishing himself for some reason. I think that's all the thoughts that I have on that. Do you have anything else? Just one more quick thing, which is huge, huge actually, is that <laughs> oh. um, we have caught oh, uh, yeah. mentioned in this, oh. uh, in this chapter. Oh, I have forgotten. And yeah, what does that say? Her, yeah, she, she, she has shard played. I don't think yeah, we, we didn't know this until now. And she has shard played, which she apparently got from Amia. From Amia! And we know that Dawn shard mm -hmm. is happening around Amia. And it makes me wonder when Dawn shard is going to be in relation to this story. Who's going to be in it? I mean, we know Risen, but... Hmm. We, we do know that Lopin 
in North will Korea. be with her. So I don't find it unreasonable that maybe more of the Windrunners will be with maybe her. Maybe like Yeah, but. Like, I, it's weird that uh, something else about Cord is that like uh, you you mentioned that or the chapter mentions that she actually killed Leshui um, mm, yes. before her current reincarnation, mm. and I find that interesting because she is actually one of Rock's first childs, and it's not mm. the horn eater way sort of for the first children to um, fight. Then said. Supposed to be, I can't remember, cooks and something else. Like, it's interesting that they apparently have the, that Rock is okay with her fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see them there when Kaladin needs the spear and she's standing there with him and she's holding her shard bow, which I think was Amaram's shard bow. Yeah. And that's the one that she used to kill Leshwi the first, or maybe not the first time, but yeah. Before that, yeah. So yeah, cool. I know. I can't that believe night. I completely like because we were because <laughs> when we when I read that and I sent that to you in the little screenshot, I was like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" Yeah. And uh, it's a note here. Also, I was I took notes while reading it, and I had to write that in all caps because it's just so exciting. It has me so excited for the Dawn Shot novella. Good thing yeah, we're getting a novella. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Be so much fun to read. Okay, so anything else that I might be missing that you can think of? I can't think of anything right now. I'm sure that we'll have lots of comments letting us yeah. know what we've missed. Please feel free to discuss those with us. We <laughs> love, love, love the discussion. All That's right. when you want to hear rampant theories about what Dawn Shards might be. Go check out our podcast on that. <laughs> yes, yes, check those out too. There's all sorts of resources. All right. Um, so this concludes chapters four and five. Uh, you can find these preview chapters, which I hope you've read oh, ahead of time, um, on tour.com every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And we will let you know when they pop up on the 17th shard.com right at nine o'clock. You can come and discuss them on the discord, on our forums, in the comments, wherever you'd like. We appreciate that discussion. And you can support us on Patreon if you want <laughs> for these videos. Cause yes. the, the okay, weekly videos are kind of a lot guys. <laughs> If you want. Yes. I know. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate that support on yes. Patreon. I've been I was one of the first Patreons and you I were. love it. <laughs> you were. You were. And then we spiked yep. you. And then I got mm -hmm. spiked. And then you're yeah. now you're mom. And I get to be on here with you guys. Yay! <laughs> Yay. All right. Till next time. Bye. See you next week. Bye.